Well, let me say first of all, do you want, uh, Simon, do you want to? Why not? Congratulations to Marianne and your team. I can't think of a more difficult job than trying to produce a world development report in any year, but to produce a report on climate change just at the point at which the climate change negotiations for Copenhagen are coming to a head uh, is about the most difficult professional job I can imagine. And <coughs> congratulations to all of you for doing what the World Development Report always does best, uh, producing an authoritative summary and review of the subject, clearly written, substantive and intelligent boxes, fascinating diagrams. I love the diagram which shows for a whole series of European capitals, there's a map of Europe, and it shows for these capitals where they are going to be like in 30 years' time, so that Paris is like somewhere in the south of Spain, I think, and Oslo is like somewhere in the north of Portugal. It is the most frightening picture you'll see uh, for a long time. Just think of all those British holiday makers you're going to bump mm -hmm. into when you go to the south of Spain. Um, you've done a wonderful job in putting this together, and it's going to be, as all world development reports are, <coughs> enormously useful. Um, I'm really pleased, too, that it links up so well to a great deal of ODI work on this topic, and no longer being director of ODI, I can say how good much of that work is on deforestation, on finance, on biofuels, on green growth, um, and on the humanitarian <coughs> implications. There's a lot of material on our website, on their website, I hope you've seen it, um, and do have a look at the reports of the meeting series that we held uh, earlier in the year with a number of um, excellent speakers. And finally, it's a great pleasure to be on the same panel as Tony Giddens, and I hope you've read his book on the politics of climate change. And if you're too busy to read that, read my piece in Open Democracy, which is a hymn of praise to what he's done in trying to talk about the business of producing a political consensus uh, for change. I'll give you the money later. <laughs> <laughs> it's all very good and, not but and. Uh, What's interesting about World Development Reports is, of course, that they are products of the World Bank. They're not products of the Gaia Foundation or even the Sustainable Development Commission. And so you have to expect and look for a certain uh, narrative, often looking between the lines. Um, this report doesn't say that uh, the West should re reduce its consumption. Uh, it doesn't say that there should be very strong limits which are administratively imposed uh, for carbon. Uh, it doesn't say we should turn our back on growth. Uh, it doesn't suggest that we should have a carbon police who would be going house to house checking up on how much people, uh, carbon uh, people are using. It is a market-friendly uh, report, which is using market-based incentives uh, in order to deliver change. I don't actually have a great deal of problem with that, although at the margin there are some very important issues to discuss around whether cap and trade and tax <coughs> or tax, uh, how big a tax, how these things are actually going to work, who's going to manage them internationally, all these are important uh, subdivisions of the narrative. But it's interesting to think about this kind of narrative in the context of having just had uh, the biggest financial crisis for several generations the sharpest, although probably not the most long-lived, recession uh, for at least uh, one generation. And so when I was reading this, Marianne, I was asking myself the question, how do your thoughts fit into the post-crisis narrative that we need to develop in our country, but also around the world, and especially in developing countries? And I've been following, as I'm sure you have, uh, the thinking from the G20, but also from um, the other UN bodies, particularly that have been thinking about the crisis. The report that Stiglitz and co. produced for the General Assembly, the, well, for the special high-level summit uh, in the summer. Uh, the UNCTAD report published uh, last week. Uh, the ILO uh, Global Jobs Pact. A lot of UN agencies who often think of themselves as being part of the heterodox uh, uh, wave of thinking, thinking about the causes of the crisis um, and what might be done about it? I mean, I think the um, uh, report by Sar Sarkozy's commission, the Stiglitz one, one is coming out today or tomorrow. And I think that's a new one, isn't it? Because yeah. Stiglitz did it's a report a one, for the for the. It's uh, got the Marcia Sen on it, and it looks like doing very high-powered uh, things. So I think it's worth measuring progress. Keeping one like mm. one employed. I think it's. Uh, I think it's today actually. Well, there are a few things about this latest wave of thinking that are worth considering as we discuss your report. 
uh, the extent to which the world has become much more vulnerable uh, as a result of globalization and actually less resilient. The degree to which inequality uh, drives crisis, uh, what they call a global version of the uh, uh, fallacy of thrift uh, following Keynes. Um, UNCTAD uh, talking about a global deficiency of demand as well and wage deflation around the world, and if we don't remedy that, uh, we will be in trouble. Three key things, I think, that run through this analysis which are highly relevant to what you've been talking about. First of all, we're going to think differently about the role of the state. You know, why have we had mm -hmm. such a relatively short recession, continuing, of course, unemployment going forward into 2010? Because we've had strong, a strong state response and strong government action. Are we going to come out of this crisis, wouldn't it be nice if we did, with a rather more optimistic view about what states can do? Aren't we going to have a rather different attitude to public expenditure? You know, why do we think that public expenditure should be trapped at 40% of GDP and not exceed it? Is there going to be a case for bigger investment in transformation uh, for the future, and therefore, of course, a slightly different attitude to tax and spend? And are we going to be forced, as a result of this crisis, to think forward far more um, what the Growth Commission, in their nice analysis of the sources of growth, talk about is a forward-looking orientation as being a key element in successful growth strategy. Now, I think those are interesting elements in the, in the current debate, and it's important to locate the conversation we're going to have, especially post-Copenhagen, in the light of how we might be rethinking economic and social policy. Um, and there are one or two implications, and let me just focus on those and then finish, Will. Uh, first of all, I'm fascinated by these numbers about the money. And of course, it's true that if you put it in the context of expenditure on dog food and so on, it might not be that much. But if you add up your uh, mitigation and adaptation budgets for developing countries, they come to about 500 billion uh, a year. Um, I looked up today um, in a table at the back of WDR but from last year, uh, how much, what's the GDP of Africa? And what's the GDP of low-income countries? And actually, of course, these are not overlap these are overlapping but not identical categories, but for both, <coughs> In other words, for all low-income countries and for all sub-Saharan Africa, the GDP is about 750 billion. So if you add in the middle-income countries, it's a lot more than that because these are poor countries and the others are richer. The GDP for all middle-income countries is about 12,000 uh, billion dollars. But you're talking about a transfer which is equivalent, I think, to about two-thirds of the GDP of low-income countries. Uh, unless I've got some zeros wrong, which I may have done. But it's a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And if you start thinking about this not as a how do we raise it problem, but how do we spend it problem, and you put it in the context of what I was saying about the size of the state and about the size of the public expenditure budget in countries, and you then ask yourself what kind of transformation developing countries are going to have to go through in order to receive and spend sensibly these levels of resources in pursuit of mitigation and adaptation alongside all the other things that you started with to do with the human development indicators and the Millennium Development Goals, what you can see is that developing countries are going to face the most extraordinary challenge over the next generation uh, in thinking about how to manage economies, in finding the right balance between state and market, in dealing with uh, the resources if they become available for example, without running into Dutch disease problems as you receive an amount of money equivalent to two-thirds of your GDP. In doing the scenario planning about how to manage um, the, these, uh, the, these futures, um, I think developing countries are just barely beginning to think about the enormity of this, and I can't think of many, India and China and the other BRICs accepted, who are even close to being able to cope with this level of, um, of, of, of change. And it does lead me back to these issues about command and control, about moving beyond market mechanisms, about managing transformations. Um, of course, we know that you know, these are not new problems and that managing development is difficult. But we are multiplying the level of difficulty by several dozen times, I think, and we're going to need to think very carefully about which developing countries can manage it and which can't. I've been writing a paper for the Commonwealth Finance Ministers who meet in Cyprus, and the image I have in my mind is of a class of children standing at the shallow end of a very cold swimming pool, and the teacher says, I want you all to jump in and swim to the other end. And some of the children are fit, some aren't, some are thin, some are fat, you know, some are able to swim, some can't. One or two will be clever and run around the side of the pool to the other end and not swim at all. The others will all jump in and they will arrive 
at the other side, at the other end of the pool, in a very different state. Some will just swim and get out and they'll be fine. Some will take a very long time. Some won't manage it at all. And I feel the recession is like that for developing countries. We're going to emerge from the recession with countries very differently enabled to deal with the next round of challenges that are coming down the pipe. And so therefore, we need to be thinking very hard about how to help them. I like to think about risk analysis, but as you do, I prefer to couch this in term also of an opportunity analysis. Um, and I do think that, and I did a blog about this last year, I think the idea of having an opportunity analysis, a bit like Bjorn Lomborg has done but with a different conclusion, is a very good way to think about the opportunities uh, we face. And to make the link to what I hope Tony will talk about, in the end there are multiple choices to make in tackling climate change. Um, I'm extremely anxious about the idea that, that Tony is very articulate on about the, ne the, the importance of having cross-party consensus. Because every time I hear Ed Miliband speak, I hear political trade-offs being made between generations, between places, between social classes in the UK. Uh, and I think it's going to be extremely difficult to hold this political consensus together. But we have to make choices, and we know what kinds of choices that we should be arguing for. We talk a lot about adaptation and mitigation. I have two more shuns to add on to that list, which are transformation and a clumsy word, but equalization. Because if we don't put social justice at the heart of what we're trying to do in climate, I think that we will be uh, left very far behind, floundering at one end of the pool when everyone else is clambering out at the other. So thank you for your report. And I hope we can have a further conversation about the post-crisis narrative and where this is going to fit in our other conversations. Thank you. Thank you.